So today we are discussing on the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita on the topic of prayer. So does God hear our prayers? And when our prayers are unanswered, what can we do? So I'll discuss this based on 719 from the Bhagavad Gita. Before we go to that verse, let's do a quick review of where we are in our discussion till now. So the previous ses two sessions, we, dis we discussed first about, the I mentioned in the seventh chapter, Krishna starts giving a more affirmative or word affirming understanding of God. That to connect with Krishna, we don't need to just detach ourselves from the world. But we can also, we basically want to attach ourselves to Krishna and we can do that through the world also. Through the world means that we can look at the world and see God in the world. And in that connection, we discussed in the previous session about, in the last second last session about science and how science approaches the world. And then in the previous section, we discussed about how even sexuality can be incorporated within the Gita's vision of spirituality. So today we'll take that same theme forward and we'll look at how people approach God and often how there are different conceptions which we approach God and when our prayers are not answered, what happens? So this is also continuing the same thing because the underlying idea is that God, most people, most of us approach God because there's something wrong in our life and we, we want it to be fixed. So it's to some extent a material conception with which we are approaching. So let's look at this and take things forward today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Bahunam janmana mante jnanavan maam prapadjate vasudevahas sarvamiti samahatma sudurlabha. So Bahunam janmana mante. Krishna says after many lifetimes, there are some people who, who become Gyanavan, who are full of knowledge. Maam prapadyate, they surrender to me. And Vasudeva has Sarvamiti. They understand Vasudeva to be everything. Sarvamiti. Samatma Sudurlapa. Such great souls are extremely rare. So the idea here, underlying idea that Krishna is speaking is that these souls who surrender to him, they are understanding that he is everything. So this 719 is the culmination of a four-hour sequence, starting from 716, where Krishna talks about how people approach him for different purposes. So we will use this verse as a launching pad for our discussion on how we can perceive God in different ways when we approach him for prayer. So different things I'll talk about, understanding the purpose of prayer and then changing our vision of God and evolving in our understanding of God's help. So some of the points in this class, I may have mentioned them briefly earlier, but here it will be more in the context of, specifically of praying. So let us look at these. So prayer is almost like a universal language of humanity. That across the world, there are different people who have, in different situations, there may be tribals, there may be aborigines, there may be, they have different ways of trying to appease the unknown. And the people might perform some dance, some people might have some kind of voodoo worship, whatever it is that they do. Most of it is usually done with a material conception. What does that material conception mean? That we pray so that we get God to change something that we can't change. That, say, there is, there is, a, drought, there is a drought or a famine in a particular place. And then certain rituals, certain form of prayers might be done to get God to, uh, to get the rains. Or in modern times, say, in India, when sport and cricket matches are there, at that time people pray and worship so that India will win the cricket match. So the idea is that we give God to change something that we can't change. Now that is a spiritual understanding of prayer. There is also a separate spiritual understanding, and that is get God, get to connect with God, and thereby change ourselves. So the purpose of praying is to connect with God. We will see this in our bhakti tradition uh, that there are many prayers, but actually there is no request at all. 
if you consider the brahma samhita prayers which are often recited in <clears throat> in our temples so we have govinda madhi purusham tamaham bhajami that primeval lord govinda i worship him the idea here is that that we just adore and worship him we use we see prayer as a means to connect with him and become absorbed in him that's, that's the primary purpose of prayer there's nothing beyond that so uh, we see this also in the teachings of prahlad where he says that there are nine ways of connecting with krishna and one of them is praying so we look at this how does one come from the spiritual to the spiritual conception and is the material conception wrong we we'll look at these things a little later so basically you may say i have some problem and i need it to be fixed yes we need it to be fixed but among our needs there are material needs are like a pain killers and our spiritual needs are like the curative medicines so we discussed earlier about what we live with and what we live for so similar concept here our material needs the material resources are like what we live with they are important but they are pain killers and spiritual needs are like the curative medicine it is when we have a for a uh, divine purpose to live for when we connect with the divine connect with krishna that provides us a sublime satisfaction which takes us beyond any other kind of agitation we may have so this is a diagram we have discussed earlier uh, this pattern but the specifics are here see if suppose somebody is sick and they don't have a painkiller and they don't have any medicine then they would be miserable that is the bottom quadrant bottom left quadrant we we'll call it first quadrant so now suppose somebody is in pain at that time the main thing they think about is how can i become free from this pain they don't think so much about uh, uh, what is the disease and what is the cure for the disease what is primarily look sort is the relief from the pain now why are material needs compared to pay, uh, pain uh, material needs compared to pain killers to so say for example we all have certain needs like we have need to eat but a hunger can be unbearably painful thirst can be unbearably painful so it's important uh, to have food and water and other such things but think about it that after we get food what happens the people who are starving are unhappy But are the people who are well-fed happy? Well, no. That's one need taken care of. But just like a painkiller, when you address it, the painkiller numbs the pain. But we need it again. Our dosage is needed again. So, like that, our material consists existence itself like a disease condition, and our material needs they are like painkillers. We keep needing them again and again and again and again. So, of course, we need them, but that is not the primary thing. Now. If somebody takes only the pain killer, that means our material needs are fulfilled, but the spiritual needs, our connection with Krishna is not there. Then we might be comfortable, we might be happy, but that's not for very long. That's unsustainable. And if we have our spiritual needs fulfilled, if we are connected with Krishna, we are absorbed in Krishna, but our material needs are not fulfilled, then it is it is not easy, but it is bearable. So we all may get some glimpses of this, say when we fast on some holy days, then we might think, normally I can't fast. But on those days we fast, and it's not all that impossible to fast. Then we realize, hey, something which I can do. So that's how it's bearable. Not for, it's not a it's not a sustainable thing, but it's bearable. Sustainable is when our material needs and spiritual needs both are taken care of. So basically, one vision of praying is that praying will provide for our material needs. That means it will act like a pain killer. So if you consider Krishna like a doctor, no doctor wants the patient to be in pain. but the doctor doesn't want that the pain simply get covered the doctor wants the pain to be cured and that's why a balanced arrangement is where both the material and the spiritual needs are properly taken care of so a bad like a, like a proper doctor would give both a pain killing medication and a, and a curative medication so that's the balance today now sometimes in some phases if one of them is not there it's far better that the painkiller medicine not be there because at least the cure is going on so what happens for us we often when we are having a mental conception of prayer the idea is that if god doesn't fulfill the particular thing that i want then what is the use of worshiping god 
So let's look at this for the way. So now we move on to the second. So when we talk about our material needs and spiritual needs, what exactly do we mean by spiritual need? So for that, we need to evolve in our vision of God. So God is not just the fulfiller of our desires. He's the fulfillment of our desires. God is God's greatest blessing. Now, whatever we get from God, no match for God himself. So, Vasudevaha Sarvamiti. This was the point which was discussed in this particular verse. When they understand, when the evolved spiritual seekers understand, it might take them many lifetimes to understand this. But when they do understand it, then what happens? Vasudevaha Sarvamiti. They understand that God is everything. And I do, if I have Krishna, I don't need anything else. Now, whatever anything, whatever attractiveness anything else might have, all that is present in Krishna. Okay. So here, so this is Bhakti Nur Thakur talks in the Chaitanya Shiksha Amrita about four levels at which we might approach God. So these are fear, desire, duty, and love. And uh, so at the first and second levels, it's the material conception. At the level of duty, it's a transitional conception and love is the highest level. So let's look at this quickly. So most world religions function at the level of fear. That means that if I don't worship him, he may punish me. So let me pacify him by worshiping him. Now this is better than atheism. But it is based on a very negative conception of God as a stern judge or as a cosmic punisher. Now, fear, now this is the level at which uh, many times religion is criticized. That oh, you know, religion induces fear in people about uh, sorry, some hell in a future life or this or that. And that's how it manipulates people. Now, fear can be a very dangerous tool uh, to power. And it can be abused very easily. So this is not a healthy or sustainable way of functioning. In fact, many, many cults, when they try to have their own members, they create a lot of fear about the other world. They dehumanize and demonize the rest of everybody who doesn't belong to the cult. So there is fear of God and there is fear of everything that is not connected with God in the way that is recommended that by that particular religion or by that particular group. So now here, when we're talking about these levels, these levels of approaching God have nothing to do with religions as we know them in the world today. There are fear-based approaches in, in Christianity, in Judaism, in Hinduism, in Islam, even in tribal groups. Now, this is leads to manipulation, but in some ways, it might be better than atheism. Because at least there is some conception of God. Now, fear also, there are different kinds of fear. So there is <clears throat> fear, consider now fear of law. Uh, now, should ordinary citizens be afraid of the police? Well, the police shouldn't be terrorists, uh, shouldn't be violent, and that causes fear. But if there is understanding that the police are competent, and if I do something wrong, I'll be punished. So, for example, when people come to India, often while driving in India, people break the traffic rules with impunity. But in the same people, when they go to America, or UK, or any Australia, anywhere else, they follow the traffic rules very well. Why? Because then there, there is some amount of fear. That I can't bribe my way, or the, I can't just get out of my way. I'll have to pay for it. So, to some extent, fear is good. So in the Bible, in the biblical tradition, it says fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But it is, it is only the beginning. It is, if that is all that is there in a religion, then that is, if we are constantly living in fear of God, how can we have any meaningful relationship with him? The next is the level of desire. So this is what we discussed initially. When most people approach God, we call it the level of desire that there are many things I want. If I don't, I can't get them myself. Maybe if I pray to God, you'll give it to me. This conception of God is more positive, not as a cosmic punisher, but as a potent desire fulfiller. The problem with this conception is that it's utilitarian. If God doesn't 
fulfill my desires then what is the use of worshiping him or if god fulfills my desires then after that what is the need to worship him so both ways it is very you can get clear information and within this there is all kind of uh, deception can also come up because people if they if all they think that all that i have to do is get my desires fulfilled then if some person claims to be god and we worship that person or we do something that person might just be magician who does something for me and is that does that make that person god so this is a very naive understanding of god and say people think that this is the when when the conception of god is primarily based at the level of desire then there is also the problem that people might think that if god is worshiped for getting things fulfilled if we can get those things fulfilled from some other way what is the need for god so o oh father thou art in heaven hallowed be thy name give us our daily bread this is good at one level that we are going to god and people are going to god and praying to god prabhupada would say that this shows one's love for bread not love for god because the more primary interest is in getting bread from god and if that bread can be got by some other means then what is the need for going to god this is at the level of desire which is a utilitarian concept so krishna talks about four categories of people who come to him we can place them in these categories which we are discussing so he said there are people who are inquisitive there are people who are in distress there are people who are seekers of wealth so those who are in distress or seekers of wealth they will fall broadly in the categories of fear or desire even those who are inquisitive they will also fall in the category of they have this desire some information they not beyond interest any further interest beyond that if you consider the level of duty the idea is that this is a little more steadier conception of god we said conception of one's relationship with god so we i talk i was talking about the conception of god but within that i'm talking about the conception with which we are approaching god because both of them are very related so if we consider a normal say child parent relationship should the child have some fear of parents well there has to be some amount of discipline and some amount of fear but fear shouldn't be the sole basis of the relationship similarly with respect to desire if a child simply relates to the parent only i want this i want this i want this well that's not a very pleasant level of uh, relationship say a child goes to college and is studying and then the only time the child calls the parents is i want some money please send otherwise doesn't call the parents at all then that's not very good like so the duty is that is a mature understanding that we have so many things that we need for our existence that are provided for without even our making any efforts so we may say that i work hard and produce uh, i earn money and then i get my food but no matter how hard we work and how much money we make if nature doesn't provide eatables we will not get anything nature doesn't provide the basic ingredients for our food don't get anything and beyond that can we pro- create air or sunlight or many of the foundational necessities for our living so god has already provided us a lot of things and and god provides us through nature there is um, i think the science, science magazine once made a, a bill to nature if we had to pay nature for everything that we did then it would this is the bill for say electricity for one state in america like oklahoma so if we consider we had to pay a bill to the sun for the energy that it is providing now that bill would be more than the the bill for just a week would be more than the budget of the whole world if we take it in terms of the billable billable hours, annual budget for the whole world so you know there is already a lot that is being provided by god so because it is here the relationship is based on gratitude for what has already been given not on uh, the craving for what i don't have but the word duty often has a negative connotation and duty can become a burden over time so now the, uh, the best level is the level of love what happens is at this level one approaches god because god is so lovable because it is krishna who is the person whom we desire person whom we crave for we understand that he is all attract and at that level we do not want anything material in return 
and it is this level of love which will satisfy the heart fully because the heart longs for love now it is very rarely as you see prahlad maharaj is an example of such pure love for god we see in his case that he was he had what he will prosperity he was a, he was the son of the emperor of the world and whatever he would have wanted he had it all but still it was that he wanted something more and for that something more for devotion to vishnu is ready to give up everything else that he had so in his prayers there is hardly any seeking of anything it is simply a loving reciprocation and a loving absorption thereby so another way to put this is you can call it as three levels of devotion there is circumstantial devotion there is intelligence driven devotion or we could say intentional devotion and there is transcendental devotion circumstantial means so this is the krishna refers to this in 716 as we are we are in some circumstances oh i am in great trouble i am in great pain please help me the circumstantial devotion then there is intentional devotion is where or intelligence devotion notion is so circumstantial devotion will be pure desire level devotion intentional devotion devotion is intentional devotion devotion will be the devotion at the level of love sorry at the level of duty and the transcendental devotion is the le- at the level of pure love now when krishna talks about four categories of people when krishna talks about four categories of people there he mentions a fourth category called jnani those in knowledge so that is what i am referring to as intelligence driven those who have knowledge and krishna says desham jnani nitya yukta ek bhakti vishishyate udara sarva evaite jnani tva atma me matam so 717 and 718 both Among these four categories of people, those who are uh, functioning at the level of intelligence, understanding that they want to develop a personal connection with God, they don't have that connection right now. They don't have that love right now, but they want to develop that. They are the best. Why best? Because their devotion will be steady, and by that steady practice of devotion, they will come to the level of transcendence gradually. So we discuss this circumstantial devotion. same way of fear the idea of love now when god answers our prayers how does he answer our prayers so once we evolve in our understanding of god then we evolve in our understanding of god's answers to our prayers so what is this mean practically speaking let's look at some examples from scripture which will help us understand but before that a contemporary example a child and a parent they have a loving relationship now when the child wants some toy say it's not that the parents don't want to give the child the toy but the point is that if the child reduces the parents love to only a toy and the child will say is that if you are if you don't give me this toy then you don't love me well that would be a very reduction is the vision of a parent's love for a child now we may feel that things that are troubling me are are not like toys they are like huge things now maybe i have important relationships coming down maybe our career is going down hill maybe our health is collapsing the could be serious problems so they are not they, they, they are not as trivial as toys yes they are they are quite serious at the same time from a, from the eternal perspective they are still temporary and this is just an example to illustrate that the parent may love the child but the child may see the parents love from a particular filter and uh, the filter of is the soil being provided or not so similarly if we try to see god's help primarily in terms of whether okay i have this problem and is this problem removed or not well yes it's important for us to look at things responsibly but at the same time uh, we have to understand that sometimes certain things may not be fulfilled so at a practical level we live in a world where there are limited resources and unlimited needs so what do we do at that time if we consider in the second world war prabhupad quoted this example that uh, 
both the, the German soldiers and the British soldiers. Both of them were religious to some extent. Because at that time, religion was much more mainstream in society. And both of them, they or their family members prayed to God that please protect us. Please protect our, protect our family. Protect. And then there are casualties on both sides. So now, of course, <clears throat> as far as the Second World War was concerned, and there was uh, Hitler was quite demonian. But if you consider any other war, <clears throat> the point is that in a material conflict or in a material confrontation, there are going to be necessities. There are going to be, you cannot have, everybody cannot be victorious. Or I started with the example of force. So say <clears throat> there is an India-Pakistan cricket match and a child plays, India plays, oh, let India win. And then India loses and the child starts saying, hey, what is the use of playing to God? But then it could be said that maybe there's a child in Pakistan and then the child in Pakistan was praying, let Pakistan win. So now in the world, we live, we often, what we desire is the outcomes can come out only in, uh, can, in one or one way. Not everything, not in every situation can everything be satisfied. Everyone be satisfied. So now God is unlimited. At the same time, this world is limited. And as long as we are looking for things in the limited world, God. God's unlimitedness is not in making the limited world unlimited. Sometimes God might, Krishna might do that and create some miracles. But in general, Krishna doesn't intervene with the normal functioning of the world. So, <clears throat> there are times when we may pray and our desires may not be fulfilled. And if we consider the protection, our scriptures describe incidents in multiple ways. So for example, Parichit Maharaj is the main protagonist in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And in that, he describes how it is it described how even before he was born, he was in the womb, Ashwatthama sent a of uh, Brahmastra to have Parishit When he was supposed to have Parishit killed, what happened at that time? The Lord intervened. The Lord came in the womb and protected and countered that person which should not be countered. And that's extraordinary. That's glorious. It's glorious of the Lord. It's glorious of the Lord did this for Parishit. So Parishit Maharaj, he later became Maharaj. At that time, he was just a child in the womb. So what happened over there? The Parishit started. His life was protected. And then afterward, when he, in the later part of his life, when he was cursed by Sringi uh, to die in seven days, uh, we could say that, and what happened? The Shura Bhagavan starts in the first canto with Parishit being cursed. And it ends in the 12th canto with Parikshit dying. There is the protection. Where is the protection? Actually, the protection was there. But it was, it was in a different way. So in the initial level, there was protection at the material level. At the end, it was, the, the snake was going to come and bite Parikshit Maharaj. And at one level, the snake came and took Parishit Maharaj. But what happened? He heard the Bhagavatam, and by hearing the Bhagavatam, he became absorbed in Krishna. And when he was absorbed in Krishna, that absorption acted as his protection. So the snake bit his body, but his consciousness was no longer in the body. His consciousness was absorbed in Krishna, and thus he was protected. If somebody takes shelter of me, Radha Lord Kapila is saying this in the Bhagavatam that 
those who take shelter of me mad ashray and they in my delightful past times they hear about me and they get absorbed in them tuna valanti kathayanti cha they delight in hearing and reciting this past time then tapanti vidhas tapa there are various stresses that come in the world but they are not troubled by those stresses why naitan mad gati chet sah mad gati chet sah consciousness is absorbed so if the god's spirit is protected at the end of its life yes what how by being granted absorption in krishna so absorption at one level is the greatest protection and he was offered that protection. so now if we consider one of the great most uh, celebrated scholars and then our prahlad maharaj well approaching krishna at the uh, approaching lord narasimha dev approaching vishnu i mean completely absorbed and there are many descriptions of miraculous interventions say for example snakes came to bit bite him but nothing happened to him the snakes went away he was pushed in put in fire but the person who put him came in fire when it was holy kashi got burned whereas he was unhurt and he was hurled down a mountain and still nothing happened to him so these are all miracles and every religious tradition has some descriptions of miraculous interventions by god when moses was taking the people from the slaves from egypt who later became the jews away from there they came to a sea and behind there was a the the agents of the egyptian pharaoh egyptian emperor and i had there was a sea so that's how the trap between the devil and the sea that thing came up so at that time it said that the sea was parted and moses and the others went across and then the sea got closed so there are descriptions of miraculous interventions where the normal laws of nature are suspended but at the same time the same scriptures also give other descriptions so in the same old testament there is the story of job we'll talk about uh, late later in the future but the story of job is that time after time job was every kind of conceivable disaster falls on job he is well with the sin and all this is all well and then he gets a crippling disease and his family abandons him his friends condemn him and then it's what's going on so calamity after calamity comes upon him so this if we now for most of us when we face distresses in life we may focus on those incidents where a krishna miraculously intervenes and protects the lotus when we talk about protects talk about protection at the material level and yes he does do that it's not that he doesn't do it but if we reduce krishna's protection only to the material level then we may find that sometimes it may seem that he is not being protected sometimes it may happen that even in our moment in our tradition not just in the past but even in the present sometimes devotees uh, may some devotees may depart in in sweet devotional settings where there are others chanting the holy names around them and that they behold a picture of krishna and they depart in the world you know this this we'll talk about the mood of consciousness while departing later in later session but sometimes the death might be very spirit you know very spiritually conducive spiritually conducive soothing setting the sometimes in the world we die in uh, terrible accidents so is it that they are not protected no not like that right is it one devotee is protected and other was not no not like that the idea is it's for us to understand that protection doesn't have to necessarily be physical protection it doesn't mean that protection will not be there at the physical level it just means that protection doesn't have to be only at the physical level so sometimes krishna may protect like with respect to parishit maharaj in his childhood he was protected in his infancy he was protected but at the material level at the, in his adulthood when he was cursed that protection came at a spiritual level so the what prahlad this real miracle and prahlad story is not that it is a miraculous intervention because that's not the if we study the shrimad bhagavatam that is the story of this prahlad he was the son of a demon 
and yet he was a great devotee and he was pierced he was threatened by his father and his father tried to kill him again and again so prahlad the the whole thrust of the story is not that prahlad is miraculously protected but that prahlad is so absorbed with the lord and that's why later on many praise to the lord his prayer is my dear lord if i am remembering you and if i am glorifying you i don't need anything else but you need it all in maham samadhi sakha but he is the lord in glorifying you is my life is being perfection so now let's bring this together so absorption of krishna is the greatest treasure so when we understand that krishna is all attractive krishna is the fulfiller of all desires then we can become absorbed in him and that absorption is what enables us to connect with him so when we pray to krishna if we see prayer as a means to get god to do something sometimes that prayer will be fulfilled sometimes it will not be fulfilled but we see it as a means to get to god to get to god means is connect with him then praying will always work how what do you mean it will always work that it will release it, it will lift the burden that we are facing quite often when we face problems in life you know, the, the the problem is there but when our mind keeps obsessing on the problem then the problem starts becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. so there is a problem in our mind but then what happens as it keeps going bigger and bigger and bigger it's not that the there is a problem in our mind rather the mind is in the problem that means initially our consciousness is here and the mind is here and the problem is here one it's, it's one component but as it is growing on the problem is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger then it becomes a part then our consciousness becomes constantly consumed by that problem so at that time it's almost impossible to be in this situation so what we need to do is we need to elevate our consciousness elevating our consciousness means that we see praying as a means to come to god so don't tell god how big your problems are tell your problems how big god is so what do you mean by don't tell your problem Don't tell God how big your problems are. That means when we are praying to God, we are not conscious about God, Krishna. We are just conscious about the problem. Oh, this problem will go away. Then will go away. Will go away. But instead, if we focus on Krishna and turn toward Him, and we try to connect with Him, then what happens? Through that connection, we are reminded about how big Krishna is. and once we are reminded of how big krishna is then dealing with the problem becomes relatively easier why because the problem doesn't burden us if there is release from problems and there is relief amid the problems so release from problem means the problem goes away relief amid the problem means the problem is still there but our consciousness rises above the problem it's like say if we are in a very hot if we are in a very hot environment and then we come to a room which has air conditioning see it's been immediately but suppose we come to the air conditioning room but instead of entering into the room we open the door and we stand at the door and we expect that the air conditioning room air conditioned room should make the whole environment cool well the environment will become cool but it will be in the weather thing it won't become immediately cool so similarly for us in the world that it's a bit of dualities that we sometimes happiness sometimes distress and if we pray to krishna to remove the distresses in our life yes they will be removed but sometimes they may not be removed immediately but when we pray to krishna we see it not that we change the weather but we you know, open the door so that my consciousness can enter into that air conditioned room and air conditioned room is the is the place where our consciousness absorbs in krishna so if we focus on praying in that way as a means to get to god get to god means get to our get our consciousness to be absorbed in krishna so whatever be the challenges we might be facing we will find that prayer will give us the strength to deal with it 
So uh, that in that sense, our prayers will never be unanswered. So now, once we understand is that if so, if we have a particular problem, should we pray to God for the removal of that problem or not? At at one level, connecting with Krishna for whatever reason that is good. I'll conclude with one story, and then we will uh, move forward. We will have some question answers here. That if we have a particular, say, if we have a particular issue in our life, the health is not good, the relationship is not there, the career is not steady. So we may say, should I pray to God for these things? Some people say that, okay, God already knows whatever I need. What is the need to pray to Him? Well, that is true at one level, but the whole point is that when we talk about relationship, it's not just about knowing. It's also about articulating. It's also about expressing. If the parents say, you know, we love my child. I love, if the parents say, I love my child. Or a child says, I love my parents. But then when there is an expression of that, then there is a there is a greater deepening of the relationship. Of course, the expression has to be appropriate, but appropriate expression does deepen the relationship. So for us, praying is not that we just want to express our need to God and demand it from Him, but if something is burdening our heart, then if something is consuming our consciousness, then we can't really have Krishna in our consciousness. If it is already there in our heart, we unburden our heart by praying to Krishna. So at least when our consciousness is consumed by some worldly issue, and even if we try to pray to Krishna, try to think about Krishna, the problem keeps coming back in our heart. Then okay, use that problem as a starting point to pray for Krishna. So we see this in the story of Dhruva. Dhruva Maharaj, he was a small boy, Dhruva. He was grievously insulted. Uh, at least he felt it was grievous that he just wanted to sit on his father's lap and he was pushed down by his stepmother who said that uh, his stepmother was the favorite queen of his father uh, and she said you can sit on his lap only if you are born through me so now he was devastated this is just a normal child's desire to sit on a father's lap and he got so angry he said you are not allowed me to sit on your lap I will not only sit on the lap, I will sit on the throne, and not just on the throne, on a throne bigger than your throne. So I'll, I will gain a kingdom bigger than yours. So how would you do that? So his mother said that I can't help you. So she, but I can tell you who can help. And she told him to worship Vishnu, and Vishnu was in the forest. Where do you find Vishnu? Some sages, sages go to the forest to find him. So he went to the forest. And because he was so determined, Narad Muni, the great sage, guided him. And, so, and he told him how to worship the Lord, how to meditate, how to perform austerities. And he did that, and by that eventually he got the uh, darshan of Vishnu. But when he got the darshan of Vishnu Krishna, he became so enriched by that that he said, I don't need anything. Broken piece of glass. Whereas you, O Lord, are like a precious jewel. Now that I have you, I don't need anything else. So when he offered that, that prayer, what had happened? He came to the level of offering that prayer because he started worshipping Krishna. So the Bhagavatam, he, when he started worshipping Krishna, it was not because he wanted Krishna. It was because he wanted something holy. But fortunately, he was guided by a devotee. And just by that connection with Krishna, he became purified. So for us, when we have some trouble, it is not that we can't pray to God for relieving, removing that trouble. Uh, is that pure devotion? Well, it may not be pure devotion, but it is devotion. And we can't, we can't become pure devotees without becoming devotees. So first we have to connect with Krishna, and then we can have a pure connection with Krishna. 
So step by step, we work like that. Uh, but the important thing is, we, we saw a brewer, the circumstantial devotion of the starting point. And how did he arrive from, arise from circumstantial devotion to transcendental devotion? That was because he was guided, guided by devotee association. So similarly, if we are in the association of devotees, and here by devotees, I'm referring not just to people who are circumstantially motivated, but those who are transcendentally motivated. That is, those who are trying to make Krishna their goal of life, as at least they are the intentional devotion, are, they have already made Krishna their be all and end all. So by that, we can drive from wherever we are to the level of transcendence. And now, the Prabhupada was asked, what is the best prayer we can offer? And he, was, he said that, please engage me in your service. Because our eternal relationship with Krishna is a relationship of service. And we serve him and we contribute, we serve, we, we serve and in a mood of, we connect with him in a mood of service and contribution. Then that connection will always be there. And at the basic level, the basic minimum service you can offer to him is offer our consciousness. Just offer our consciousness to him. So through our prayer, even if we nothing else is like, even if nothing changes, praying itself is a service that we can do. We offer our consciousness to Krishna through prayer. And we offer our Krishna consciousness to Krishna through many other ways like that. So Krishna, please engage me in your service. If we have that consciousness, we find that whatever problems we have, the burden of those problems will decrease. And in that sense, of giving us inner strength, the prayer will always be answered. So when we reconceptualize how Krishna answers prayer, or what is the answer that is truly important, then we will find that praying is always a virtue. Even when it is externally sometimes fulfilling or not fulfilling. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. And then we can have some questions. So I started by speaking about um, understanding how we pray. So the idea in the seventh chapter of the Gita is how we approach God through this world. So through this world means that we often have our worldly needs and desires for which we approach, for, because of which we approach God. So how does that lead to our spiritual evolution? That's described in this particular Section of uh, discussion, in particular uh, discussion in the class. So first is understanding the purpose of prayer. In the the material understanding is that we get God to do something for us that we can't do. We get God to change something that we can't change. The spiritual understanding is when we connect with Krishna and that changes us. So it's a radically different conception of prayer. And at one level, prayer is like a universal language, but it's usually at the first level. And then where, at, the, at the level where we seek God, seek God for getting him to change something. And then at the, the four quadrant diagram of our material needs are like pain killers and our spiritual needs are like the purity medicine. So God wants to give us both. Just like a doctor will give both. But if somebody rejects the treatment or considers the doctor incompetent just because the painkiller is not given, so that is a that is a self-sabotaging understanding of the process of treatment. Then, so we talk about the four quadrants. So if our material needs are not fulfilled and spiritual needs are not fulfilled, that's unbearable. If our material needs are fulfilled, but the spiritual needs are not fulfilled. And that's, it's like taking the painkiller. It's unsustainable. But if we don't have medicine, the pain is going to grow. If our material needs are not fulfilled, but the spiritual needs are fulfilled, then it's bearable. So that's the situation where we are praying to Krishna for something, but that's not happening. But at least through the prayer, we are connecting with Krishna. And the connection itself is, is, absor is uplifted. Absorbed. And then we move to the last part where, where, the, where the material and spiritual needs are both taken care of. That is a sustainable way to practice. So then we discussed about what do we mean by spiritual needs? We talked about evolving our, in our conception of God. So we see God as the not just the fulfiller of our desire, but the fulfillment of our desire. We talk about four levels at which we approach God, fear, desire, beauty, and love. And then I talked about 
transcendental and intentional so we talk about three levels of devotion circumstantial intentional and transcendental and then uh, so we need to have the transcendental we talk about the journey so last part is if our prayers are not answered what is happening so we look at how the scriptures talk about god's intervention in various ways sometimes it's in miraculous ways which is described in various traditions but it's not always in the miraculous ways and uh, if we expect god to fulfill all our desires or all our prayers if we think that our if we reduce our relationship with god to his fulfilling our our requests and that's what the child is seeing the parents love only in the toys that are being provided so overall we if we look for that kind of fulfillment uh, solution we might not get it we may not always get relief from problems but we can get relief amid problems that means that the weather may still be hot but we can get into an air conditioned room so that means the like the problems burden us so much that they become like a blazing heat within us and if we just pray to krishna at that time and keep praying as a connection with him then at least that burden goes away that blazing fire goes away and that's the relief and so if we have some material issues can we pray to god in this is the story of prahlad of the of um, dhruva how we pray and by that he was elevated so if we have the association of the god then we have a intense knowledge about how things work then we will however we approach god it will be a position so we pray let me serve you lord and our con- offering our conscious situation is itself a service so yeah. doing that then we are auspiciously situated so we pray not to get god to do something but we pray to get to god thank you very much pray so let's look at some questions now so how can we absorb ourselves in krishna because often we have to do our work and even that we can get absorbed we need to be absorbed in our work that's fine we will be discussing later in our one session about how work can be done also in the mood of worship so we we absorb ourselves in our work but we before we start the work we remind ourselves that i am doing this for krishna and then after we do the work we thank krishna for giving us the opportunity to do that work and while we are doing our work also whatever abilities we have we understand that they are gifts from krishna so we may not be consciously remembering that but as long if if we have reoriented our life or are reorienting our life in such a way that krishna is the ultimate purpose of our life if that so that if we do that then everything else will fall in place because if krishna is the purpose of our life and our work is also meant for us to connect with krishna so when arjuna was fighting the kurukshetra war it was not that he was while shooting arrows he was not he was shooting arrows hey krishna hey krishna krishna pray hey he is not sure he was chanting at that time no he was completely absorbed in how to how to parry which blow how to counter which arrow how to bring down this and he was completely absorbed in that but his purpose was to serve krishna because the war was fought for krishna now our job is right now is exactly like that for krishna it got that we are doing it because krishna is the purpose but we understand that we all have various duties in our lives and if we if our life is meant for serving krishna then everything that we do is meant for also for serving krishna so we can regularly take time to remind ourselves that our work is also for krishna so that way If you have an intellectual orientation, then you won't get completely. You will be absorbed in the work when you need to be, but you won't get consumed by the work. So that it's like okay, this is so. If I'm going to my work place, my workplace is my service to Krishna. So let me do it as well as I can. But then after that, okay, I'm studying. Uh, I'm coming to a temple or I'm hearing a class. at that time if i start thinking oh, what will happen will i get a raise in my job or not will this happen or not what if that person does some politics against me no i am a i am meant to serve krishna so i did that service whatever are the results krishna and krishna sent now i am doing this service now let me hear about krishna let me speak about krishna 
So like that, we focus on uh, doing it in a mode of service. So we do it wholeheartedly while we are doing it. And when we do some other service, we do that wholeheartedly. So the distress that Prahlad faced was because of his devotion to the Lord. Was this a certain example for others? Yes. The, our Acharyas have explained that whenever a great devotee faced distresses, there can be multiple levels of understanding of why that distress was faced. So one level of understanding is that it is because there was some malefic character over that. You know, Hiranya Kashyapa was seen. So he was demoniac, and then he was opposed to the worship of Krishna. That's why that happened. That's one level of understanding. And it's a valid level. Another level of understanding could be that it was because the Lord had a higher plan. And the higher plan is, in fact, Prahlad himself says in one of his prayers to the Lord in the 10th chapter, there are his prayers in the 9th chapter of the 7th chapter, and there are also prayers in the 10th chapter. There he says, my Lord, you have sent me here to, to exhibit or to demonstrate the principles of pure devotion. So yes, he did not have, he hadn't done anything wrong because of which he was suffering. It was not his karma. Right? Rather, it was through him, the Lord was teaching all of us how, how to face sufferings uh, and even when we, they are not merited, I mean, they, are, they are not done anything to deserve those sufferings, still the suffering come upon us, how to deal with them. So sometimes when you pray to Krishna for something, and he fulfills that desire, but what does it mean when he takes that away after a short time? So it depends. The three things are there over here. When some things come up or come to us, uh, we could say that they just came by the arrangement of our own past karma. They came because of Krishna's arrangement. Or we could say that it's Krishna's arrangement acting through our past and present karma. So the thing is that we, if we have a mood of serving the Lord, always, then if we have particular resources, we use those resources to serve the Lord. If we don't have those resources, then we serve the Lord in whatever way we can. Now, when Krishna gave it to us, we understand that that was so that we could serve him. And when they take it away, then Krishna is, that is meant that now Krishna wants to be served without these things. So, we see this happen to even to Arjuna. Arjuna is often defined practically. Is defining material of the writing because it is archivist, it is a peerless archivist. And he, toward the end of his life, that particular archivist was taken away from him. And he can not absorb in Krishna. So it's difficult uh, to understand specifically why Krishna may give us something and then take it away. In the case of Chitraketu Maharaj, it happened in the sixth time of the Bhagavatam to describe that. He didn't have a child and he, he desperately sought a child. And after doing some rituals, he finally got a child. He got a son. But then he lost the son. So what was what was it? He was meant to learn that ultimately, apart from Krishna, nothing is going to satisfy him. So don't crave for anything. What is desired for Krishna shouldn't be desired more than Krishna. So at different times, now for him, and he thought that I am a king and I need an heir to continue on the dynasty. So I need an heir. So what, what am I going to do? So he, he was, in a sense, it was what he wanted was for a service to Krishna. But still, he realized that this is, not, if this is not what Krishna wants, then we accept that. So if we have a relationship of service, centered on service, then we can accept the arrival and departure of worldly things also. About devtas, I will discuss in the future session. We are going to come to the concept of devtas soon. In the next session itself.
So when we pray to God for material thing, does the reaction of previous karma is supposed to come change or it goes same? It's, uh, it's not that simple. We shouldn't think that reactions are like uh, sometimes say if a person is traveling in a is traveling on a road in a mountain and there's a landslide. So it's like you dodge one one particular boulder that is so that is coming down, another boulder hits you, another boulder hits you. So it's it's like you are going on the road and the boulders are already fixed and they are coming down. And sometimes we dodge, sometimes some hit us. So we sometimes have that conception of karma that it's like that. There are already boulders on the path and some are going to hit me. Karma is not frozen like that. It is dynamic. Dynamic in the sense that. Yes, we all have from our past lives a certain quantum of actions for which we are accountable. But beyond those, how we act in this life also matters. So we, we make sure that we do our best in this life. And one part of doing our best can also be praying to Krishna. So how exactly prayer will intervene with the karma you know, we, we don't know that it's Krishna's plan. Uh, that how Krishna deals with the particular karma for a particular devotee. We don't at all know that. What we understand is that praying is also a part of bhakti. So here also again we are saying that we don't we don't just pray for the material thing. We pray for connecting with Krishna and use the material thing as an impetus to connect with Krishna. Gahana karma nubati, how karma will work out. We don't know that. Now, some devotees might give us and just saying that actually it is just postponed. So what is the use of praying for Krishna? Praying to Krishna. Well, that's one way of looking at it. But it's, it's just one way. See, it's like, um, to give another example for this, if somebody is a sports player, somebody is a cricket player, now, any say somebody is a batsman, then the, see, all batsmen will sometimes get wrong decisions. That means they may not be out and they are given out, and they are out and they are not given out. So now, if you consider a player plays for 10, 15, 20 years or whatever, uh, in five years, overall, by the law of probability, you could say that the number of times when they are given out fairly or unfairly, it equals out, it evens out. They are given out when they are not out, or they are not given not out when they are out. But when that happens is also critical. If if it is if somebody is uh, leading a team to victory, or somebody is uh, that their very place in the team is at stake, and at that time they are given out, then the consequences are far more uh, far more severe than when say if the whole team has got out and there's only one person is remaining, and then a decision goes wrong that especially critical. So similarly for us, if there are 10 problems coming upon us, and if we pray, and one problem is burden gets minimized some way by that. Okay, we could say that just the reaction will be postponed, but yes, uh, facing 10 problems might not be as difficult, it might, might be much more difficult than facing 9 problems or 8 problems or 7 problems or 5 problems or 3 problems. So, trying to get into this whole frame of karma, can almost dehumanize our practice of bhakti and dehumanize our life journey. So we don't have to go into that, that zone so too much. I'll answer a couple of questions and then to many questions we can take in the future also. So if somebody starts practicing bhakti very seriously, like say they join the ashram and then they understand afterward that only spiritual needs are fulfilled but material needs are not being fulfilled. And they start blaming the authority and what should we do at that time? There has to be some amount of realistic understanding and realistic education. If that is not coming, then that is a matter of concern. And as a moment, we are also evolving. And Shila Prabhupada was present in the, in the planet. Many devotees had that idea that, that just in a few days, we are going to take over the world. And and then a few days later, we are all going to become pure devotees and we are going back to Krishna. 
there was quite a ethos of minimizing and rejecting the world and its problems. But there are intricate problems and they need proper solutions. So Prabhupada himself, when he was departing from the world, he said that or if the Krishna conscious movement is to spread, he didn't say that we just have to chant Hare Krishna. He said we need organization and intelligence. So organization for what? Organization for, for, for holistic care of devotees, for a holistic understanding of bhakti. Intelligence is required. So yes, is it that if that is happening, that only spiritual needs are taken care of, then over a period of time that needs to be communicated so that devotees make the arrangements for material needs also. So sometimes I think that this is a little, as you rightly said, your question is immaturity. So as devotees go to more experiences in life, then they also become more mature and understanding how bhakti is to be practiced, is to be presented. So it is important for each one of us to, to recognize that we are not practicing bhakti for a day or two. It is for a whole lifetime. And yes, it is, it is possible that we may die tomorrow. So we should be serious about practicing bhakti. At the same time, it is also possible that we may not die tomorrow. And if say, some devotees are neglecting their health and they are just not taking adequate rest, not taking other things properly. And Prabhupada told them, if you don't take care of your health now, in the future, even if you are enthusiastic to serve Krishna, you won't be able to serve him. Why? Because the body may not cooperate. We may have a repetitively damage the body. So we need to recognize that while we are intense in our service to Krishna now, at the same time we understand that we are taking a long time and we have to see what is sustainable for us. And that is sustainable, that is what is to be done. That is how bhakti is to be practiced. So each one of us has to find out um, how best we can sustain our practice and move forward to practice bhakti in that way. So Prabhupada talks about the story of Gajendra. That Gajendra, if he had been on land, Gajendra was an elephant who was caught by a crocodile. And while he was in the lake, so he couldn't hold on to the crocodile. He couldn't fight against the crocodile while he was in the water. But if he had been on land, he would have been better. So Prabhupada says over there, each of us has to find out how we can do that situation so that we can become absorbed in this thing. And blaming authority, well, it's an understandable human reaction. But we have to see that our movement is quite young and uh, we are all learning, even our authorities are learning. So that's why Prabhupada said a tradition where it's not that just we just have one authority, but rather we, it's not that we hear only from one person, we hear from multiple teachers. That's why the Shiksha uh, Gurus are many. So we get multiple perspectives, and ultimately, there is not just that there is obedience to authority, but there is also Prabhupada said we have to become intelligently thoughtful. That means we learn from our authorities and we use our intelligence to understand how best we can practice that. So if we think of following authority as outsourcing responsibility for our spiritual life to others, it's a misunderstanding. Krishna did not want that from Arjuna and Arjuna did not do that. So no, Arjuna, you have to take the decision. So yes, we are all learning, and uh, rather than blame authority, we should just see that yes, there is some experience. At a circumstantial level, I went through some difficulties, some problems because of that. But I did it in good faith to try to serve Krishna. And even if circumstantial some difficulties are there, through the, all that experience, I can go closer to Krishna. But how I can go closer to Krishna in a sustainable way, I have to find it for myself. The locus of responsibility always stays with the individual. It doesn't stay with the spiritual master, it doesn't stay with the authority, it doesn't stay with the institution. The locus of responsibility is always with the individual. Okay.
तो हाउ कैन वी ऑलवेज स्टे ग्रेटफुल इन ऑल सर्कमस्टांसेस वेल इट्स नॉट इजी बट वी कैन लुक एट इवन इफ वी कैन बी ग्रेटफुल फॉर ऑल सिचुएशंस वी कैन बी ग्रेटफुल इन ऑल सिचुएशंस by looking beyond those situations on my website the spiritual scientist as well as my youtube channel there is a whole class on gratitude i talk about three things over there look for the when bad things are happening when the unbearable and sustainable situation sustainable circumstances are there for us look for the good around the bad when bad things are happening so what is the good around the bad don't obsess over the good but look for the good that helps us to counter the bad and look for the good that may emerge from the bad so if somebody has lost a job it's a bad thing but don't just focus on the lost the job look for the good around the bad so maybe i have got uh, got some good marketable skills i have got put some friends i got some experience uh, and you know i have got the consciousness by which i can ensure that my mind doesn't revolve me during this short time look for the good around the bad Look for the good blessings that come from the bad. What can I do? Look for those blessings, and then look for the good that may emerge from the bad. Okay, maybe something better will come out. And if you look at our lives, uh, often sometimes terrible things happen, and we look back at our life and think, "Through those terrible things, something better comes out." So, A C that the acronym I use: Look, ace your life with gratitude. So, A C is look for the good around the bad, the good to counter the bad. And look for the good that may emerge from the bad. A C E. Why are the inquisitive devotees in the desire category and not in the duty category? It depends on conception. So, if somebody has the conception that oh, I just inquire, I'm just inquisitive in terms of I saw some devotees dancing on the streets, I read something on some TV show, I heard something on a TV show. That's why I want to know. That might just be inquisitiveness. It comes and it goes. So, what kind of inquisitiveness it is, it also varies. So, there could be inquisitiveness which is also out of duty. The jnana can be casual, can be circumstantial, or it can be intentional also. So, if it is intentional, that means one is seriously inquisitive or knowing about, or to know about things. Then that's then that's a different category. So the sages would ask you to go some of the questions. Uh, they are described as an inquisitive category, but they are not with the desire category. They'll be the. They had intelligence. They understood the importance of practicing bhakti and of connecting with Krishna, of knowing about the ultimate reality. And accordingly, they practice. So that is different. So it will depend which category inquisitiveness will fall in. Do we do we lack in absorption in Krishna because of our previous bad karmas? Why can't we absorb ourselves in Krishna? Yes, definitely is because of our past karmas. Because based on our past karma, our mind has developed a particular momentum, particular attachment, particular conceptions. So the mind wanders here, there, and everywhere, and it makes it very difficult for us to function. But thankfully. So when we talk about past karma, it doesn't necessarily have to be in terms of something unknown that we have done in the past and that is creating some troubles for us. Is that can also happen? But whatever it is, you know, we can't always absorb ourselves in Krishna, but we can occasionally absorb ourselves in Krishna, and gradually we can make that absorption more and more. So we start with what we can do, and we gradually increase that, and that's how we all grow in our spiritual lives. Just do one thing at a time and keep increasing the gratitude. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Jai Prabhu Pad.